Excellent. Okay, looks like we've got people coming in. It's just after 8.15 on Wednesday, October 14th. We're so glad you're here with us virtually for coffee and conversations. Uh, you know, normally we, we'd be doing this in person, but uh, as we have been for the last several iterations, we are here virtually. Uh, I'm so glad to have Tom O'Donovan here with me, the uh, water director at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And I will get him introduced just here shortly. We'll see if we get some more folks rolling in. Uh, Coffee and Conversations, uh, if you are unaware, is a discussion series that is jointly organized by the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire the New Hampshire Bureau of Education and Training and the New Hampshire Association of Certified Public Managers. Thank you all for being a part of this. So without further ado, I see a few more folks jumping on. I will introduce Tom, our guest today. So with over 35 years of public service in positions of increasing responsibility, Tom has served as a senior leader in the US Army Corps of Engineers a senior manager with the Department of Energy, and as a project director in the construction industry. His career highlights include service worldwide, for example, Bosnia and Afghanistan, leadership of the largest hydropower and the most advanced regulatory district in the Corps, responsible for major strategic changes at the Bonneville Power Administration, and delivery of a $4 billion construction project in the Middle East. His credentials include a master's in civil engineering, registration as a professional engineer, and certification as project management professional. He is married with two children and both are engineers. He is currently the water division director responsible for over 300 water professionals, a budget of over $168 million and over a billion dollars of ongoing financial infrastructure investment in the state. Tom, welcome. We are so glad to have you with us this morning. Thanks, Jordan. It is, it is great to be here and, and by just Hosting this session, UNH uh, substantially contributed to the uh, drought by causing it to rain. And very little <laughs> time, whenever we host a major session about the drought, it rains just in order to underscore the point that uh, it is a chaotic process. So thanks for having us, Jordan. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Tom, uh, I think, you know, maybe as far as format goes, we could start with, uh, I don't know if you have any other opening remarks, but we'd be happy to start with your presentation uh, and then we can uh, move into the Q&A uh, from there if that works for you. Yeah, that works great. So let's see, uh, let's, uh, let's attack the, uh, the digital challenge. Let's see if we can get the right screen to show here. All right. And uh, let me know if you've got the right screen up. That looks great to me. Okay, great. Well, again, good morning. I am Tom, uh, the Water Division Director with a big, uh, big group of my friends, about 324. We're responsible for a wide variety of things, all things essentially water in the, in the state. Uh, Jordan had sent a couple questions that he felt the audience might be interested in today, and those are listed at the top there. And we'll walk through those in a relatively logical and uh, well-sequenced uh, approach. I threw down a couple of my own questions at the bottom there that I'd like to thread through the conversation also to help uh, illuminate uh, more aspects of the drought and what DES is and what our role is. And certainly for the, uh, our audience today who are public policy people interested in or practitioners of or experts in public policy, we can certainly thread the public policy aspects of this uh, together. Although public policy by itself is not a term that's Particularly well defined, but uh, but it's obviously a very important one. So let's see if we can make this thing. Uh, let's see if we can make this thing go. There we go. So there's the mission statement of uh, DES overall. Uh, Water Division is the largest division within the department. The department's about 470 or so people. We're about 324, so you can see we're the big we're the big hitter. Uh, they've, we've got the Air uh, Division and the Waste Division, and then I've got uh, Water Division. Water division's got a whole bunch of different components to it that I kind of wanted to walk through so that you understand how drought as a multifunctional uh, disaster uh, is, is touched on. So we have the Land Resources Management uh, Group or program that has our alteration of terrain folks, our subsurface and our wetlands. So they're all regulatory functions that regulate septic systems, construction projects, and wetlands protection. 
Then we have our other bureaus and programs. We have the dam bureau, so 2,300 dams statewide. About 250 of those belong to the state. Uh, we regulate all dams higher than six feet uh, and uh, responsible for all the waters that those dams hold. Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau is responsible pretty much as exactly as described. And uh, they obviously have a key role in the, in the drought. Wastewater Engineering is the regulatory uh, bureau for all the wastewater plants, the sewer plants statewide, 72 uh, major plants uh, that protect, uh, protect the water of the state from sewage. And we have our Watershed Management Bureau. They're responsible for all the lakes, rivers, great ponds, and streams statewide, uh, 7,500 miles of uh, river. And then the Winnipesaukee River Basin Program, we actually have a state uh, run wastewater treatment plant that covers the west side of Lake Winnipesaukee, a big program that started in the 70s and uh, keeps the lake uh, sewage free. So that's kind of just who we are and briefly who, what we do. All right. I'm also serve as the chair of the statewide drought management team. This is a governor's convened uh, organization that helps to address the drought. Now, the drought management team is an important tool for information flow. And currently, uh, before you have a declaration of an emergency, uh, which we have not had for a drought uh, in many, many years, and the, and the federal government doesn't normally do drought emergency declarations either, information is our primary tool for addressing the drought. And we'll talk about the different parts of information that we try to get out. But the DMT brings together all of these organizations you see listed there and more. There's about 55 members or so including state, federal agencies, and organizations like the Ski Areas Association and uh, others that have deep-seated interests in water and uh, working to uh, control aspects of the drought. So that's the DMT. And getting the message out is so important. Uh, this picture uh, taken uh, a couple weeks ago uh, shows that the person on the left got it, got the message that water is short during a drought and you need to stop watering your lawn and other optional things like that and save water. And the person on the right clearly didn't get the message as they continue to water their lawn and use water uh, during a drought that we don't view as uh, being for a good, uh, a good purpose, an important purpose. Uh, so the key thing that I'm also working on today by uh, participating in the session with you today is I want your help, uh, you the participants, and help getting the message out about the drought and water conservation. And we'll touch on that a little bit. So how did we get here was sort of the first question or really what Jordan asked is what is a drought? And you would say, that's a very simple question, Jordan. Drought is the lack of precipitation, lack of water. That's a drought. Uh, you know, we're scientists and engineers here in DES and uh, it's way more complicated than that. And the first public policy issue comes into play right here. As you know, one of the underlying tenets of New Hampshire's public policy is never do anything at a cost in New Hampshire that you can get the federal government to do for you. And that's how we do it for drought also. Our drought uh, designation comes from a national drought center uh, out in the Midwest uh, that works on data from scientists and, and uh, uh, practitioners, uh, certified practitioners across uh, the United States, and they develop a drought map. And I'm gonna walk you through that. But here's how we started. The, the chart on the, on the left, and let me get my, uh, can you see my arrow uh, riding around there, Jordan? Yes, yeah, we can see your mouse. Okay, so this left-hand chart uh, is how we started to know that we were in trouble for 2020. In January, we started to take, uh, we, we routinely take snowpack measurements across, uh, across the state, and we convert those to a water equivalent measurement to tell us how we're doing for snow. And this chart, which looks really uh, intimidating at first, is not that bad. This is the months across the bottom, January to April, and these charts show how much, these lines show how much snow we had in uh, water equivalent, snow water equivalent, at each point during those that time frame. So you can see this big red line that goes up like here was a very, very heavy snow year uh, that we had. And then you can see this big cloud of lines here. These are just sort of all our average snow years going through here. And then you see this black line right here. And that was January and February of 2020. And we knew then uh, we were already in trouble. We had the fourth lowest snowpack in over 100 years of record that you see here, almost 100 years of record. And uh, you can see just how low it is. And then it fell off uh, into March and basically went to zero. And so we knew in February that we were looking at a difficult water situation. And then later, as, uh, as the year went on, normally uh, we get impacted by a couple tropical storms that come up uh, uh, late summer, uh, early fall, that dump uh, two to three inches of rain on us. And those are critical 
towards uh, ensuring that uh, the summer ends successfully for water. And they all missed us uh, this year. Tropical Storm Isaias missed and Tropical Storm Faye both missed. This is Isaias right here and you can see, even though the center of the storm went right up the Connecticut River Valley, uh, right here, uh, because of the way storms spin in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, the rain is always on the left-hand side, on the western side of the storm, and all the rain was west of the Connecticut uh, Valley, and so did not contribute to our drought area, which is right here, uh, centered on south and southeast uh, New Hampshire. So the problem started with a low snowpack and was exacerbated uh, by lack of precipitation during the year, and then really culminated with the lack of tropical storms uh, late in the year. So let's look at a little more closely as to what a drought is. So the United States Drought Man Monitor, USDM, is run by a coalition of uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, NOAA, and other federal organizations that provide science and information to a central group that develops the drought map. And the drought map is a nationwide tool uh, that describes where uh, drought is going on across the state. And it designates it in a D0 to D4 uh, designation. And here we have the designations that occurred for us uh, over the summer or, or from the spring into the summer. So we had D0, uh, which was designated on 26 May, and that was prim primarily the Merrimack Valley. And then D1, which is moderate drought, occurred on the 23rd of June and was primarily in Southern uh, New Hampshire. And then uh, D2 occurred on the 18th of August, and that is, D2 is severe drought. And that uh, was Stratford County, primarily center on Stratford County. And then D3, which is extreme drought, which is what we're in right now, also occurred uh, in Stratford County and uh, on the 22nd of September. So you can see this map right here on the September 10th, shows New Hampshire right there, and you can see the different levels of drought that occurred at that time, and D2 uh, was what we had. And then here's the map from last week, Thursday, the 8th of October. And you can see D3 stretching into uh, southern and southeastern New Hampshire. You can also see drought up in Aroostook County in Maine, and then all across Rhode Island, Connecticut, and southern, southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, so this is more than just a New Hampshire drought. This, in fact, is a regional drought uh, that is impacting millions of people across uh, New England and the Northeast. Now, specifically for New Hampshire, what does D3 mean? So you can see the D3 area uh, right there that, uh, that impacts about, uh, uh, about a, th a third of the population of the state. And here are the different descriptions of what the D levels mean. So D3 is described as crop loss is widespread, uh, dairy farmers struggling, well drillers and bulk water haulers see substantially increased business, Water recreation is, and hunting are modified. Wildlife disease, both aquatic and, and terrestrial uh, outbreak is observed. And extremely low flow uh, for water in surface waters. River temperatures are warm, wells are running dry, and people are digging deeper and deeper wells. So that's some of the characteristics of what D3 looks like. And by the way, we're seeing all of those uh, across, uh, across this southern part of the state. Now, the way this map is developed is each week, uh, the National Weather Service hosts a forum called the Drought Early Warning System. And these experts come together and they pull in information on groundwater, surface water, water temperature, weather forecasts, rainfall, uh, drought, uh, uh, sorry, crop impacts due to drought, and a whole bunch of information like this. They thread it all together and they de de develop uh, this map. So there is a both objective and subjective piece to what the definition of a drought is. And each week we participate in the dues uh, system for the Northeast and get our input in uh, to the national map. And then it comes out each Thursday morning at 8.30. And uh, the website is right there. If you're interested in following uh, what happens with the drought uh, each week, it comes out Thursday at 8.30. And uh, we always get a lot of feedback on how well we did in developing the description of the drought. All right, then you asked uh, the next question Jordan asked, a really good question is, okay, give me the background on droughts in New Hampshire. Give me some, uh, some feedback. Now, there are more ways to measure water in New Hampshire than you can imagine. Uh, in fact, there's a way basically for every hydrologist and hydrogeologist who works in the state, and there's hundreds of them. This one particular product uh, from USGS describes the total runoff of the state. So think, think of the state as a sink, and all the rainfall falls in it like water going into a sink, 
And it all goes out through one pipe at the bottom and you measure that pipe at the bottom and that's the runoff from the state. Now, obviously the state is not a sink. So the situation is way more complicated than that uh, by many more orders of magnitude. But that's basically what we're looking at here is the total runoff from the state each year for the last 120 years. So this is a pretty long period of record is a term we use, us engineers use. So you can look at that chart for a minute and say, okay, that's kind of interesting. Uh, the human eye always tends to look at charts like this and say, I see cycles. I see cycles right away. I see periodicity. I see ups, I see downs. You can even put an eyeball average to that thing and say, okay, I can see some low points in there. Uh, that must be droughts and so on and so forth. And so you can actually take what you can do by eye and you can convert it a little bit. So that green line across the bottom is uh, across the middle there is the actual 120 year average. That is we have a runoff of about 24.9 or so uh, inches of water per acre per year. Um, and you can also see some of the extreme uh, events we've been through. So here's the drought of 16, which was a very substantial drought. And you can see some interesting characteristics. So the drought was a low runoff year. That makes sense, but you can also look at the shoulder years and see that we had low runoff in the years before and leading up to the drought and a little bit after. So that tells you that surface waters and groundwaters were already impacted even before the, the low drought, the impacts of low precipitation in 2016 uh, kicked in. So 2016 was a very substantial drought. We hit D4 uh, for a very short period in that drought. And the drought of 02 and 03 was also substantial. You see that same characteristic of low uh, water the year before and then uh, low water the next year. And that drought was also very substantial. We did not hit D4 in that drought, we hit D3 in that drought. And then the real monster was the drought of 64 to 66 was a multi-year drought. And you can see that we had low, uh, low uh, water for several years, low runoff for several years, culminating in the really low year of 65. Now, of course, New Hampshire was a different place at that time. It had about half the population it does now, very little industry, a very tremendously rural state at that time. And we're a very, very different state now uh, than we were then. But that is what is called the drought of record. And the Merrimack River, for example, dropped down to two and a half feet deep uh, during that drought. Uh, so, you know, basically became a stream, only about 12 to 20 feet wide, uh, as opposed to what you see when, uh, uh, when you go into UNH, uh, when you do go in. Now, what's also interesting about this chart is it also shows some of the highs. And right here, you can see the flood of record uh, for New Hampshire, which were the floods of 36. And you can see that we had multiple wet years in there, but the flood of 36 was a multi-storm specific event. And it was really, really substantial. And uh, in fact, there was a book done on it. Let me see if I can, uh, uh, we won't mess around that much, but I've got the state actually published a small book on it. Well, actually you can see me, right? Yeah, we can, we can see in the corner of the screen there. Yeah, great, thanks. So the state, the floods of 36 were so substantial, so destructive across the state that they actually published a state book, uh, a collection of photographs of it. You can get this, uh, if, you're, if you're really persistent, you can find it in collections and that kind of thing. Um, but the floods of 36 were so destructive that the state undertook and the federal government undertook a major construction program uh, to install flood control structures across the state. We now have today, uh, dams, flood control structures that were built in the 70s based on work that started in the 40s in terms of design and, and uh, hydrology to determine where they should be built and how they should be built. And you can see them today in Franklin, for example. Uh, there's one of the major structures there that is a flood control structure run by the Corps of Engineers to help protect uh, the towns downstream. Um, so in any event, so there's a little bit of background on droughts in, uh, in the intro. Let's see if we can get to the next slide. And then you ask, what's going on with the current drought? How long might it last? Now, Mary Stampone is the state climatologist. She's actually a UNH professor and uh, serves to work on all the climatology aspects with a team, including Cam Newton and some of the other premier uh, folks that help understand the weather and the climate uh, for New Hampshire. Uh, they are the definitive experts and they provide us information. Of course, the most recent uh, comprehensive work was a national climate assessment of 2018 uh, published uh, by the United States that described weather both nationally, uh, internationally, nationally, and regionally. 
and then they broke it down for each state. So you can take a look at, and I've got the website listed there, and these, these slides will be available uh, later also. Uh, you can see for New Hampshire, uh, since they started measuring observed number of hot days, and they have a definition of number of days and temperature above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and you can look at that chart and draw your conclusions about what's going on. But then you can take a look at observed annual precipitation, and the trend is a little clearer on total annual precipitation in inches. And you can see we do appear to be in an increase in precipitation. And we'll talk about that later, uh, a little bit later in more detail. But the point is, nobody can predict how long a drought's going to last. We try to do accurate 14-day forecasts based on a variety of parameters that seem to have good correlation uh, to, uh, to weather for 14-day forecasts. The 14-day forecast right now is for average uh, for us. And uh, OK, that's you know, helpful or not helpful, depending on your point of view. Uh, in terms of whether the drought's going to end or not. Uh, we do know that the rain that we just received uh, the last couple days, or really the last day and a half, uh, came in a little more than forecast, which was a big change uh, from the rest of this water year, uh, because most of the forecasts have been coming in light. They would forecast an inch, we'd get a half an inch. Uh, this one came in, they forecast an inch, and we actually got an inch and a half in some areas, uh, up to two in some uh, other areas up north. And so that's a good start towards ending the drought. The next storm is scheduled to come through Friday, Saturday, uh, looks like it's going to bring about two inches, and that if that actually occurs and comes in as forecast, that begins to actually move us off of the drought. But let's remember, the drought has got us uh, five inches short uh, in most areas, eight inches in that D3 area as I was showing you, and then some specific areas where 11 inches of water short. So it's going to take more than two storms at one or two inches each to bring all our water, surface water and groundwater, back up to where it needs to be. All right. I'm going to pause there and check in. Nick, do we have any questions at this point? And I'm also going to catch my breath. Yeah, we did. We did have someone write in uh, asking uh, whether those charts were national or just New Hampshire, and then they wrote in again to say that they saw the light text on there that said it was New Hampshire. So Great. those are all the those are the questions we've gotten so far. We encourage folks if you have questions as they come up to. Uh, Put them in the uh, Q and A box there, and we'll we'll get to them as as they come up. So please feel free to ask questions as you have them. So continue on uh, Jordan's question of what's going on with the current drought. So let's look at some of the impacts that are occurring. So first of all, we have water systems. Uh, we have 700. Uh, well, we have 2,000 water systems statewide uh, of different types and styles and sizes. Uh, but of the community water systems we have out there. Uh, we have about 150 right now. This number goes up and down uh, all the time. I think this week we're up to about 165. Uh, but we have water systems that are implementing water use restrictions. That is, they've told their people that are using water in their system and paying for that water, they told them, look, we're concerned about our supply. We need to reduce our demand for water. And so they put in lawn use restrictions, car washing restrictions, and these kinds of things, uh, which actually have pretty serious impacts if you're a gardener or, or someone like that. Uh, and this map shows the black dots, show where those water restrictions are in place. And you can see the majority of them are in, the, uh, in or near the uh, largest impact of the, of the drought. We also have two rivers that have watershed management plans in place, the Sauhegan and the Lamprey. And these watershed management plans have specific actions in them. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. And then, of course, we have agricultural impacts. And uh, this was a very, very tough year for New Hampshire's farmers. Uh, the hay crop, for example, uh, suffered very, very heavily. They got in basically the spring hay and there was no further hay uh, from the fields. You know, usually you get multiple uh, uh, harvests from a hay field uh, over the course of a normal water year. Uh, but during a drought, they got one at, at best. And even that one wasn't too good. This shot in the upper right is an irrigation pond at a farm. And you can see they have sucked that thing dry. This picture was back in uh, June, July. They were already bottoming out, bottoming out uh, that pond at that time. So those are the kinds of impacts. And we'll, we'll go into some more detail on what's going on. Let's take a picture just to compare surface water during droughts. Here's a picture from the Isenglass River up in Barrington. And I've, I've shown on the map where that is out uh, north, uh, northwest of uh, Fort Smith, and basically in the drought, uh, most impacted area for the state. This is a picture from 2016, that last big drought that I talked about four years ago. And you can see that that surface water is bottomed out. You can imagine what the uh, biology of that, uh, that uh, surface water is, the fish in there suffering, as well as invertebrates and, and other uh, 
biota. So that's what it looked like on August 17th. Uh, let's look at it of 2016. Here it is in August of 17, uh, basically the same picture location. And you can see that really big difference in the amount of water there. There you can see it in 18, very, very good water year. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of flow, lots of good uh, habitat. And then you can see it in 19, again, good water flow, looking good. And then there it is uh, two months ago here in the drought of 2020, and it's right back where it was in 16, heavily, heavily impacted. So that's an example of what uh, surface water impacts look like during the drought. Or to put it in, uh, you know, engineers and scientists love charts. So here's a chart that takes those pictures and converts it uh, to, a, to data. And the way this chart works is this upper line right here is average stream flow. And then for each watershed, and we have the coastal Piscataqua region, the Southern Connecticut Valley region, the Northern Merrimack Valley region, Northern Woods region, each of these regions are shown with one of these lines here. And the way it works is this line is showing how far you are below average. So like a bank account, you know, you know roughly how much average money you have in your bank account. But if somebody came in and told you, hey, your bank account's at 50% of average right now, that would probably get your attention. And down here, this orange band is 10% of average. And then this red band is uh, four or 3% of average. So basically way down there. And these are our severe and extreme droughts. And you can see exactly what happened in our watersheds. In the January, February timeframe, that lack of snowpack would have, if we'd had snowpack, these lines would all be up here around average, but we didn't have snowpack. So our watersheds all fell, the amount of water in the watersheds uh, fell. Then we had this series of thunderstorms that rolled through in the spring time frame, some fronts, but never really any real substantial. And so each time it recovered a little bit and then it dried out, recovered, dried out, recovered, dried out. We bounced around for a while. And then in May started the big, long, real ride down to the most serious impacts in the July uh, time frame. Then a series of storms came through, helped us out a little bit. And then again, another big dry ride all the way down to where we were in October, where all our watersheds were down into uh, less than 10% of their normal average. That is really, really substantial. Another picture of the upper, of another water, of another, <laughs> another river, uh, the upper Sugar River showing just how bad it can get when they essentially dry out, all right? Let's talk about that. Uh, these charts are uh, another scientist and engineer's dream come true, so I won't go into them too much, but Bottom line on both these rivers, the Sauhegan and the Lamprey, is that they have watershed management plans that establish things that must be done if the water drops to a certain level. And that what the level is, the action level varies by season because it tracks the natural uh, behavior of a river. But the Lamprey, for example, is a, is a managed river. We have reservoirs upstream that hold water. And if the Lamprey gets low enough, the watershed plan, uh, which was a public process to develop it, uh, uh, has to be implemented. And those reservoirs have to let water go in a freshet or a, uh, a surge of water through the river to help restore the biota, to give it a chance of surviving through the drought and help people who have wells uh, on the banks of the river, kind of restore the groundwater for them and uh, help clear out debris from the river and these sorts of things. Uh, so we actually, we activated that watershed action uh, two times this year for the lamprey. And you can see one pulse uh, flowing through the lamprey right there. That's where we pulsed water through in the September timeframe. Mm. So those are the only two rivers right now that we have watershed plans in place for as a result of the in-stream flow program. We have two more rivers that are in the process of developing it. And then we have a series of designated rivers after that in the years to come that we will try to uh, get through the in-stream flow uh, program to get a watershed plan in place. By the way, this uh, did on the Lamprey and the Sahegan did include restrictions on big water users like golf courses, uh, uh, restrictions on their use of water to help uh, all water users uh, better through the drought. And of course, for uh, uh, water consumption, for drinking water, uh, the Bellamy Reservoir, uh, there's a picture of it from 2018, good water year. And here it is from September 25th of 2020, uh, a not great water year. And you can see they had to pull that reservoir down, way down, in order to uh, supply drinking water. All right. Here's another example. This is Lake Francis. This is up at the headwaters of the Connecticut uh, River. And uh, the Connecticut River, as you know, is one of the major rivers for New England, flowing through four states and eventually into Long Island Sound. And uh, this lake is the 
a control reservoir for hydropower on the upper stem, uh, upper portions of the Connecticut River. And you can see just how low it's been dropped in order to maintain uh, hydropower flows uh, in the Connecticut. And that's one of the reasons why the Connecticut River has actually done a little better in terms of flow is because we held water uh, from the winter and we held it early because we knew we had low snowpack. And uh, then we we're able to use that water to keep hydropower and other critical resources on the river uh, functioning. So that's uh, Lake Francis. You always know it's a bad sign in a reservoir when your reservoir gets below the bottom of your boat, uh, boat ramp. Yeah. That impacts, uh, that impacts recreation and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. Now this is another engineer's dream come true, but what it essentially illustrates is the point I just made about managing dams. So the major impoundments uh, for New Hampshire had to be managed very, very carefully with the low snowpack. And basically, if you look up here in the upper left, this white line represents the, the rule curve. That's the line we're supposed to follow for a managed reservoir to bring it to bring it low during the winter for a variety of reasons, and then fill it in the spring, and then keep it at level across the summer, and then gently draw it down in the fall to be ready uh, to accept water again in the spring. That's the basic cycle for all reservoirs uh, worldwide. This year, the red line, you can see we had to fill early to capture mm -hmm. what snow we did have, we actually went outside the standard deviation of the rule curve, which is very unusual, and then bring that thing in and get it to where we, uh, to the to full. And then you can see that later in the year, it started to dry out. We got some inflow right there. That's what that purple uh, uh, line represents. Uh, but then we reached this point right here where outflow became greater than inflow and the whole big bathtub began to drain. And you can see the red line dropping, dropping, dropping. And eventually, uh, a few weeks ago, we actually crossed over the minimum water levels we had seen in Winnipesaukee in, uh, since 1982 to 2019, uh, wow. the, the management time frame. So uh, Winnipesaukee, we were able to get it up to full for most of the summer. And then once it went into free fall, there's really not a lot you can do uh, at that point. Very important, Lake Winnipesaukee, obviously the largest lake in New Hampshire, very important water resource, recreation resource, and tax value of the people uh, on the banks of that. Uh, now let's talk about the other half, uh, the other portion of the water equation for the state in a drought, and that's groundwater. Uh, you know, New Hampshire is called a water-rich state, and in many ways we are, and in some ways we aren't. Our aquifers tend to be very shallow, and they tend to be pretty responsive to annual cycles in precipitation unlike Kansas or other places where your aquifer moves in 10 or 50 year cycles, our aquifers move in an annual cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, this chart, uh, just all that red all over the place, all these red squares and circles are monitoring wells uh, across the state where we monitor the levels in the wells to tell us where the groundwater is relative to our period of record. That is our measurements for as long as we have them. And to just summarize, they're all red, tells you that uh, groundwater levels are low. Now the impacts of this, of course, are uh, about half of the state uh, lives on residential wells, and that means we have residential wells going dry. And we are seeing that. We don't measure that because we don't regulate residential wells, but we have enough concerns now that the governor and the department have worked together to develop a program, uh, first of its kind to, uh, in the state, to assist residential well owners. And that uh, is going to be proposed tomorrow to, the, uh, to a trust fund that has funds available uh, for these kinds of problems and begin to develop the program to address this problem for uh, people who are severely impacted. All right. Okay, do you, and then of course, you, okay, go ahead, so, questions. Yeah, do you mind if I jump in with one here? Please. Um, so we have, we have a question from the audience that I, I think is somewhat related asking, you know, so so for water use restrictions, uh, are those recommendation based, or or do they get enforced in some communities? And if so, you know, what does that kind of look like? You mentioned the golf courses. Um, just wondering if you might be able to expand a little on that. Yeah, first of all, great question. I should have explained that back when I was talking a little bit about the water restrictions. We encourage mandatory restrictions because we found over the last couple of drought cycles, voluntary restrictions do not reduce demand, not substantially. Uh, you have to put in place mandatory restrictions. So we generally find out of those 160 we have in place right now, about 130 of those are mandatory. And that's a decision made by the municipality or uh, the owners of the water system. So if the municipality owns the water system, they make that decision, the town 
uh, like for example, Manchester Waterworks. Um, and for smaller systems like uh, uh, a system that serves a, a retirement home area or something like that, the manager of that retirement home uh, working with their service provider makes that decision. Uh, we have had changes in the law, and I can get to those at the end, where we have enabled towns to put restrictions across industries within their town. It used to be that uh, some industries like uh, uh, a given industry that wanted to water its lawn out front so it looked really nice, like a real estate uh, or something like that, uh, they can now put restrictions on them and golf courses. And that law is reviewed every two years, and it's always a contentious discussion on uh, what authority towns should have to restrict water within their townships. Uh, and we can we can review that law in a little more detail. I've got a backup slide. Okay. The other, of course, uh, result of uh, drought is increased fire danger. Uh, this year, uh, and these slides are from the DMT presentation we did uh, a couple weeks ago where we had the, uh, the fire management uh, folks for the state in. Uh, for discussion, we have had some fires as you've seen in this uh, picture here uh, so far this year, but we're actually uh, down a little bit in total acreage burn. And we believe that is due to people being really, really cautious, which is a good, which is a good thing. Um, when we do have fires because of the COVID, uh, it becomes much more labor intensive because you got to spread people out and all kinds of other things. You can only move people in uh, one person to a vehicle and all this other stuff. It makes for a real challenging and because the soil has dried out so far, uh, so deeply this year, you tend to get uh, ground fires. That is the fire gets into the, the duff, the, uh, the forest debris on the ground and burns through there as opposed to being up in the trees where you can fight it uh, better. So it's increased the labor intensities. And as of uh, last month, we had 207 fires and 83 acres uh, damaged. However, the index, the KVDI, uh, which very, very closely follows the, uh, the overall drought uh, monitor map. You can see the highest levels of the index are in the southeast corner of the state. And uh, any time it's above 400, the index is above 400, they get very concerned about fire. And so as the summer went on, uh, the governor got very concerned about this and went to the executive council and said, uh, we need to put some restrictions in place to try to reduce fire danger. And so they did. And those restrictions were put out on the 24th of October and included the list that you see there. And those were all public lands statewide. A lot of people thought they were only in the, in the Southeast corner of the state, that was not true. It is statewide. And so uh, again, we believe, the fire community uh, believes that this approach has been effective at helping to reduce uh, fire impacts across the state. Uh, we are, and as you already mentioned, this again is a slide from the, uh, from the drought management team a couple weeks ago. We are receiving an increased number of calls for residential wells, and we do have a program uh, developing now to try to address that. Most of our calls are from people who have dug wells. Dug wells are, uh, you know, the old style well, three foot diameter you know, or smaller, uh, but uh, that are just dug in, dig them in with a uh, excavator or back in the 1800s, they dig them in by hand, but, uh, and they just go down 10, 20, 30 feet uh, down to a water bearing layer. And uh, many of the dug wells that were dug back in the 1800s, 1900s have gone 100 years without ever going dry. And then in uh, this drought, because we had such a low snowpack and groundwater levels are lower than we've seen in many other droughts, a lot of those dug wells are drying out. And we very much encourage people who, are, who live on dug wells to work towards putting in a deeper well uh, to avoid these uh, variations caused by drought. Our water well contractors, there's about 20 big water well contractors uh, statewide. They do about 80% of the business. And then there's about another 80 that do the other 20%. Uh, but they have a big backlog right now. Uh, in fact, uh, some, some well drillers are telling us they've got a three month backlog right now of work. So if you run your well dry and you think you're gonna call up a well driller to come in and drill that well the next day, deeper by a couple hundred feet and get the water again, no, that's not going to happen uh, because there's somebody who's been dry for a couple months who's already ahead of you in line. Now, the well drillers do try to take uh, people whose residential wells go dry first instead of um, irrigation wells or other type wells like that. But still, they have a pretty substantial backlog, particularly in the southeast portion of the state. Of course, uh, one of the things we've been trying to do, just as I said in that last couple sentences, we've been trying to message to people. This is obviously not 
a quick read for you, but this is a, uh, a media release that we did uh, where we tried to be a little bit provocative with the title. New Hampshire DES says last chance to conserve and ask residents to report well supply issues. And we were trying to remind people here that conserving your water doesn't start when your well goes dry. That's too late. That's like buying a fire extinguisher after your house fire is started. Uh, that, that's pointless. You got to buy the fire extinguisher ahead of time, put it in the house, and have it ready to go when that kitchen fire comes, and then put the fire in the house. And conserving water is like that too. You got to conserve water while you have water. Because once you go dry, you're in a whole whole different problem set. We've been working very hard to get that message out uh, across the state, and particularly within the drought impacted, most severely impacted area. Now you also asked uh, what kinds of steps can individuals take and what steps are state and municipalities take? So, so primarily we're working in the area of messaging and our messaging is about conservation. Uh, that is conserving at the individual level, the community level and at the, at the uh, uh, lake level. And it's also about control. So we're trying to control our lake impoundments like I just illustrated to you for Lake Winnipesaukee. We're trying to control our surface water resources like I just illustrated with Sauhegan and Lamprey. And we're also trying to control uh, people's desire to put bulk water into wells. So a lot of people think if my well goes dry at my house, I'll just go whistle up a tanker truck of water, pump that water down into the well, and then I'll be good. And, you know, and that is not the case. There's a variety of problems with that approach, and we can talk that. Of course, we're also messaging about fire prevention because fire can be so very destructive, as we've seen in the, in the West mm -hmm. of the United States. And then, of course, in agriculture, we're trying to message that even though agriculture in New Hampshire was severely impacted, we do have an apple crop this year. We do have a variety of other agricultural products and people should be buying those products to help the farmers uh, get through this drought uh, without losing their, their farm. So those are the kinds of steps that both individuals and, uh, and public uh, organizations can take. And I'm getting pretty close to done here. Yeah, we've got a few questions here too, so okay. we can hold the, we can hold the, we can either do them now or we can hold till you're done if you're close. Uh, let's let's take a question now and then uh, we'll, we'll do the rest. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, so th this question is pretty relevant to the last slide you just showed. Uh, what are the primary outreach tools that uh, DES uses to message around water issues to state residents? Right. So. The First of all, we have to decide what the message is, and that's one of the purposes of the DMP is to bring experts together to talk about what messaging we want to get out, like fire prevention and these sorts of things. Then DES specifically, we message through a variety of outreach channels. We have a, a, a public information office that is quite expert. They've got about 2,000 uh, people uh, on a standing list like NHPR, WMUR, and others that we will uh, send uh, media advisories to them as different things occur as the Thursday drought map comes out or as a major front is identified coming through or as um, uh, the governor makes a decision to put in place uh, fire uh, restrictions. Um, and we put those out. We also have social media accounts, although our social media team has been a little bit hit by the hiring freeze lately. And, uh, but we, we try to work the social media piece. And then the third leg of course is when we get calls from folks like you, Jordan saying, hey, can you come by and talk about the drought? We say, absolutely. Uh, because this is such an important way to get messaging out through public policy professionals like your audience. Awesome. Okay. All right. Now, the really tough question you asked is, what's the relationship between, between drought and climate change? And should we expect this to be a more regular occurrence? Now, first of all, you need to understand DES is not a climate change organization. We don't, you know, we study climate change, but we don't study the drivers of climate change, we study the science of climate change as it is published. And so we look very closely at, at climate change work. We don't, DES is not particularly interested in what the drivers of, of climate change are. That's a, that's a national problem and a, a policy problem. A DES is interested in what the results of climate change are. Let me give you a specific example. So over the last 20 years, as you've seen in, in the chart in the upper right, uh, annual precipitation has uh, increased in New Hampshire. Now, statisticians, hyd hydrologic statisticians, take a look at that, and they try to extrapolate from that what is the largest possible storm we could have. And so the increase in precipitation in the last 20 years has caused those statistics to move. We now believe the biggest storm we could possibly get is bigger than the design storm we had back in the 70s when we designed a lot of the dams uh, across New Hampshire. 
So now that we know more, we have a bigger period of record is the technical term, but we basically know more about what weather we have seen that helps inform what weather we think we are going to see and what the possible extreme is, the 100 year storm, the 1000 year storm, the 10,000 year storm. And so we design our dams to those extreme events. That means our dams now are undersized, uh, some of our dams. And so we have to go back now and either correct the dam by increasing the spillway so that it will flow that water and not tear the dam out. Because as you know, dams function, they hold water up until they don't. And when they don't, there's two ways, two things you can do with the water. You can either take it over an emergency spillway that is sized to handle it, or you take it over the top of the dam and that tears the dam, the dam down and then you lose all the water. And I was, a, I was a responder in Puerto Rico and I've seen what 30 inches to 40 inches of rain does uh, to a reservoir that is not properly sized. Mm -hmm. And so many of our, not, not many, but reservoirs across uh, New Hampshire are now undersized based on our increased understanding of what the climate uh, change is doing. You know, uh, so there's kind of an example. Uh, so let's take a look at it a little bit more strategically. The, the National Climate Assessment says the world is warming up, okay? And that chart on the left, figure 1.3, shows for New Hampshire, uh, right in this area, under the low or the high scenario, an increase of uh, one to three degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And then, and that's mid 21st century. Late 21st century, uh, warmer by, by much, and in the higher scenario by a lot, up to six to seven degrees, okay? A warmer world is a wetter world uh, for a variety of different reasons. And so this essential uh, an analysis here uh, tells us that sea levels are going to rise uh, for a variety of reasons. And precipitation is going to increase. And the number of hot days are going to increase. So we do know from the National Climate Assessment that the models indicate increased precipitation and increased variability in precipitation. They don't, as I understand it, and I would love to, I haven't had a chance to really talk this in detail with Mary yet, because she's been tied up in the day-to-day -day fight with the drought, but I'd really like to know what the latest in the models uh, uh, show, because models have made major improvements in the last uh, three years. You know, Even though this report was published in 2018, the, the, the work for it ended in 2017, and then they went into writing. So now we have three more years of better models, better data, uh, better analysis, really like to know, okay, well, what does that indicate for us for droughts? Well, I will tell you personally, as a water director, it tells me I should be more concerned about floods. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm more concerned about. New Hampshire has not had a 20 to 30 inch rain event in about 30 years, 30, 30, 35 years. And the periodicity for that, as we best understand it, is about 30 to 35 years. So we're a little overdue uh, for a major hurricane to come right through New Hampshire. You know, we had Irene uh, hit Vermont very hard. We had Sandy uh, hit uh, New York and other areas very hard. Uh, we have not been hit directly by a major hurricane in a long, long time. And I'm very concerned about it. Um, and so we're trying to do some study work now on what happened in South Carolina, for example, with their storm most recently came in, gave them about 20 inches of rain and study more about how they managed the water, what they did right, what they did wrong, and see what the uh, lessons are applicable, applicable uh, to New Hampshire. All right. Okay. Well, I'll save. I'll save that slide. Let's uh, let's just pause there and see what other what other questions we have. All right. So yeah, we've got a few here. Folks can keep bringing them in. Uh, but next question on our list uh, kind of goes back to talking about uh, restrictions. Uh, you know, in in water conservation uh, ordinances and things like that. Are there fines imposed when a business or homeowner doesn't follow a mandatory water restriction issued by their district or town? What are, uh, what are the consequences of, of not Absolutely. following that? Absolutely. That varies town to town, system to system. Uh, but there is the possibility of fines. And, and people have received tickets, if you will, from law enforcement saying, hey, you got caught watering your lawn on a Wednesday when you're a Tuesday, Thursday person. And here's a $50 fine. Feel free to come on down and, and challenge it if you want to. Um, we. Now again, DES has no role in that. That is all regulated at the town and water system uh, level. But let's uh, let me let me advance to one quick slide here. Mm -hmm. So the legal mechanisms to address drought, which is sort of the underlying part of the question it, it was just asked, there's sort of a series of pieces to it. So in the upper left here, 
We have large groundwater withdrawal permits. So that is where we, the state, regulate Poland Springs or, or Monadnock Water or somebody like that who wants to put in a well and draw a lot of water out of the ground, you know, in, in the order of uh, tens of thousands of gallons an hour type thing. Well, obviously, if they're going to do that, that is a regulated activity. And uh, we have laws that uh, govern that. And during a drought, if groundwater falls, there are provisions in their permit to operate that say you need to reduce the amount of water you're drawing so that you don't impact the people around you. Uh, we also have the emergency authority to approve new large groundwater withdrawals. So if you have a farmer who wants to pop a drill in, uh, pop a drill rig in and drill a well for an emergency because he wants to irrigate his land, and he has large enough land that he believes he can do that without impacting anybody else, we can support that. We do our own analysis, of course, to decide whether that's correct or not, whether in fact that will impact other neighbors or not. And then if it will not, uh, in our best engineering estimate, we will enable that emergency permit. Of course, it will have a lot of regulatory conditions to it uh, when that permit's issued. We do have uh, municipal authority to restrict or ban residential lawn watering. And this applies to both, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, this is public and residential wells. So the town of XYZ can say, we're putting in a water restriction, and even though you're on a private well, that water is held in trust for the people of the town of XYZ. You are not going to use that water uh, willy-nilly. You're going to have to comply with our restrictions for use of that water uh, for residential wells. Uh, we also have the authority to direct dams that are not state-owned. So if you have a private or a uh, municipal dam in the state, that water that it holds is still held in trust for the people in New Hampshire, we can direct that dam to do certain operations if we believe that's appropriate thing to do. Obviously we do this very rarely, very rarely. And then uh, we do have the authority to require a public water system to extend service uh, to uh, address a nearby emergency. We have done that uh, twice in the last 10 years. It's also a very rare thing to do. Now, the key authority uh, for this one on lawn watering is RSA 4411-D, and uh, it's the law that I was referring to. And every two years that comes up uh, for review, it can come up uh, for mm. review. And here actually it is, this is RSA 4111-D uh, right here. And it says, here's what the town can do. The local governing body may establish regulations restricting the use of water from private wells or public well water systems for outdoor lawn watering when administrative agencies of the state or the federal government have designated the region as being under a declared state or condition of drought. That's the key sentence right there. Then it goes into details whoop, about how to do that. All right, that was, a, that was a bit of a comprehensive answer to that question, but I hope, I hope we got to the. No, I, I, think that's, I think that's a great answer. And I, one of the things that's really interesting to me about this is, I mean, water use is such a classic public policy, public good, question, you know, everyone needs water, uh, you know, how to allocate it most equitably, given variable conditions like droughts and flooding. It's a, it's a really fascinating policy question. And so I, I appreciate you going into depth with that. Um, so you have two questions that are basically the same. And you, you touched on this earlier with some of your, uh, when you're showing the pictures of uh, the river earlier, but how severe are the impacts on wildlife, uh, especially aquatic species? Yeah, um, we won't know uh, what the, uh, the extent of the impacts are uh, for quite some time. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes uh, a lot of measurement and those kinds of things. At, at this point, we don't know. And uh, it's an area that we'll be studying over the next uh, year to two years. We estimate though, based on experience in previous droughts, uh, that it is substantial. A lot of these rivers have now uh, what, they, what they call pooling. That is the river flow has almost dropped to zero and the water has pooled and the fish can no longer move back and forth up the river. They're now trapped in these pools. Mm. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a great news story for uh, birds and other animals that feed on fish. So they're gonna, they're gonna do great uh, right now. And uh, meanwhile, the fish are going to really, really suffer. Uh, so we have another question that's a little bit more of a comment than a question, but maybe you can comment on it here. Uh, the models are saying we should expect more extreme, heavy precipitation events and also longer periods with no or very little precipitation. So I'm sort of inferring the question here being, uh, 
you know, you, you mentioned that the flooding was, was really uh, more of, of a concern over, over climate change, but maybe it's, uh, I guess this person is asking, you know, is it more just the extremes are going to become more extreme? Right. You know, uh, I spend a lot of time with climate scientists uh, over, the, over the last 30 years or so as the science really advanced. But the fundamental physical principle is, is pretty simple. When you add energy to a system, the system becomes more dynamic. And uh, so as we add energy to the atmosphere, as we add heat to the atmosphere, the, the overall thing becomes much more dynamic. Things move faster. The jet stream swings more quickly. Um, and temperature variations are more uh, substantial. And so everything gets more dynamic and in more dynamic comes those extreme events. And that is that is exactly the source of our concern. Great, well, folks, feel free to add in uh, any other questions. Those are the end of where we're at at the moment. Um, and so, uh, Tom, did you have any more slides or did you want to, I can, I have a few questions myself. I can, uh, let's go with, let's go with your questions, Jordan, and see what those, uh, see what those illuminate for us. Great. And is Sherry, is, uh, have you got the, uh, you got the list there, is Sherry Godlewski out there? I see you got the participant list handy. Let's see if Sherry's there. Cause, uh, we can always go to Sherry on some of these really, really good questions on uh, climate. She's, uh, she's one of the members of the climate change team for DES. Should okay. Yeah, Sherry, Sherry's here. I can uh, I can bring Sherry in and allow I'm, her. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Hi, Sherry. How are you this morning? I'm very good, Tom. And you? I'm good. Well, I'm glad you could join us today. I don't know if you have any, you want to add any additional thoughts on the climate change uh, points we were chatting about? No, I think you did a great job hitting the key points that, you know, New Hampshire really is very concerned about flooding and we're due for a big one, like you mentioned, but we do see these periods of short-term drought and that's where we are right now. And when we think about our municipal officials and our water resource managers, it's really interesting to have to manage, right? Huge flows that we experience periodically as well as these short-term droughts. And so I think that Education is imperative so that everybody understands and can make the connections between what we see in the world around us, specifically here in New Hampshire, and how these things that we're seeing are showing us that our climate is changing and we need to continue to stay current on science and be able to manage for the extremes that we're experiencing. Great point, Sherry. And let me, let me illustrate uh, one of the points Sherry just made about the team's monitoring of the science. As we monitor uh, the, the science and the modeling, uh, we were required by uh, the legislature to produce a report on sea level rise. And it took, uh, ooh, Sherry, maybe you can help me out. I think it took two, three years uh, to bring the right folks together and really hammer out a, a comprehensive and uh, well-founded uh, model for New Hampshire for what we expect sea level rise to be in the next 50 to 100 years. And so we published a document on that that describes what uh, New Hampshire believes is sea level rise expectation. And then we published a tool, uh, a guidance document to help say, well, if this is what we think sea level rise is gonna be, here are the things you should do about it. And obviously that you know, primarily has to do with the coast, but the implications go deeper than just right at the immediate coastline. You know, as sea level rises, saltwater infiltration underneath the land uh, contaminates wells that are near, uh, the, uh, uh, near the coast. And so we have to be concerned about that. They also affect septic systems uh, because the distance down to uh, groundwater changes and a lot of other second, third, fourth, and fifth order effects uh, begin to occur. So that was an important document that we got out uh, uh, late last year. Yeah, we had uh, Kristen Howard uh, almost a year ago now uh, talking about coastal resilience in particular uh, across a number of factors, but she really touched a lot on, on the flooding going on there and, and the work that was happening um, and that was that was a great conversation we had. And we have a, another question here that I think also kind of touches on what you were just talking about with some of the different impacts. Um, you know, you talked about water quality impacts uh, based on things that happen due to uh, due to flooding. Uh, this question is, what's is the impact uh, of the drought on water quality? Right. So so first of all, uh, the way our water systems work. Uh, they're regulated for water quality. 
So they have to deliver water to their customers that meet certain parameters. Uh, maximum contaminant levels is, is one of the terms we use. MCLs. So we have MCLs for all these different uh, contaminants and they have to meet those uh, MCLs or they can't produce water for uh, the public. And they are, they continue to meet even despite COVID, uh, which is a phenomenal achievement in and of itself. And despite the drought, they continue to meet regulatory requirements. So we're, we're really impressed with that. Now, for residential well owners who may or may not be tracking their well, uh, as well, uh, you know, the dynamics here are a little tough to explain, but let me try it this way. So the way water works in New Hampshire, uh, the deeper the water is, the longer it's been there, basically. So if you're pulling water from 30 feet deep, like at a dug well, basically that water got there within the last year or two, uh, you know, percolated down through the soil and the, and the gravel and that into where it is. Water down deeper, 300 feet, uh, is very typical depth for residential wells in New Hampshire. That water has been there a lot longer. And when it's been there longer, it has the opportunity to pick up uh, more contaminants, uh, specifically arsenic uh, is one of the primary ones we're concerned about, but so is it radon, uranium, many of these others that are found deep in the granite of, of New Hampshire. And there's a long geologic reason why they're there. Um, but the bottom line is as surface water levels drop, the amount of water total there is less. That means the contaminant level goes up. And so we are seeing arsenic levels go up in residential wells across the state. And that's a bad news story in a couple different ways. Uh, first of all, our best models right now, and they are just models, they're just estimates, but they are the best we have, is that about 116,000 people in this state are drinking water right now today above the arsenic MCL, the maximum contaminant. That is, they are drinking water that we consider to be unhealthy, substantially unhealthy. And arsenic, as you know, as a poison, it's been a poison, you know, it was used for assassinations back in, you know, the 1800s kind of thing, or 1600s, whatever, um, is a very, very poisonous substance. And it has specific impacts on unborn children, uh, that is pregnant women, uh, has impacts on uh, children's development, on their lungs, and on their overall health. And um, we are very, very concerned about that, have been concerned for a very long time. And we've tried to educate and outreach the residential well owners to test and treat, test and treat, test and treat, test your well. And if it is, uh, uh, has a, you know, violating an MCL, then treat it so that you're drinking clean water. This last year, we had a team come together and develop a unique program working with the Department of Health and Human Services. And we're offering pitchers uh, that is like a Brita style pitcher, a pitcher with a filter built into it. Actually, these pitchers are even better than that. They have an electronic device on top that tells you when the filter needs to be changed. Hmm. Um, and uh, we are offering these filters free to pregnant women in, in New Hampshire who are on wells, where their wells are above the MCL for arsenic. And uh, it's, a, it's a prototype program. We're running it as a research project uh, and uh, uh, studying how this helps pregnant women have healthy children. And we think it's a very, very important contribution. Jordan, as you were talking about before the show started, you know, the cost of education is something that all New Hampshire is concerned about. Well, the cost of education goes down when the children are healthier and smarter. And uh, so we can deliver, directly contribute to the reduction in education costs by helping uh, New Hampshire citizens have healthy children. That was awesome. a long answer. Sorry about that, George. That was a, that's, a, that's a great answer. I think, you know, uh, I appreciate the, the comprehensiveness and that, I mean, the program uh, sounds great. I mean, you know, protecting mothers and children, it's, uh, you know, and, and people who are, uh, you know, potentially could be poisoned by their, by their water. I, I, think, I think that's a great program you have going on. We think, we think it's a good public policy initiative. And, and if, it, if it goes well, and we have good results from it, we're gonna try and spin it out larger uh, beyond this first set of 500 women that we're trying to get into the program to start. Great, got a couple more questions here. Oh, a few more popping in. Uh, does the water division of DES work closely with DOT uh, to assess infrastructure that might be at risk from extreme precipitation and runoff events? Uh, some of the examples they gave are sizing bridges, culverts, and ditches. Yeah, absolutely. We do work very, very closely with DOT. And it's a very good working relationship, even though we work on some really contentious issues uh, together. I meet, uh, we, we, uh, as an executive, I meet with uh, Bill Cass, the Assistant Commissioner for DOT. We, we meet regularly, once a month, uh, to resolve issues between our two departments. Uh, and uh, 
on a whole bunch of different issues. So uh, let me go to that infrastructure question. Yes, uh, DOT has a copy of our guidance on sea level rise, for example, and how to um, uh, implement our forecast for sea level rise into culvert sizing, bridge height uh, design, and those kinds of things. Uh, second, on major projects like the I-93 uh, project that is just finishing up right now, we of course have to issue a variety of permits uh, for the work on that, the wetlands permits, uh, the water quality certs, stormwater uh, management, and all of these kinds of things. And so we actually had a comprehensive program put together just for the I-93 upgrades, this fourth lane that went in. And of course, the primary concern of all that was salt. And we can talk about salt as one of the top five contaminants that I'm uh, worried about as director, mm. uh, but uh, addressing how to uh, reduce the salt impacts in the I-93 corridor, which are substantial. And of course, we were also part of the team for the Exit 4A project as it went into the uh, design build uh, process to help ensure that the lessons we learned from I-93 environmental considerations uh, were implemented in the Exit 4A project. That project, of course, is on hold right now, as uh, you heard the governor announce a couple of weeks ago, uh, due to bids coming in uh, very expensive, which was not an environmental, environmental was not the primary driver of the cost increases uh, on that project. But, um, and then, well, okay, I'll pause there and see if that, see if that kind of covered the question. The answer to the question is yes, we work very closely with DOT. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. And we've got a few other questions here too. Um, so Bob uh, says, exceptional presentation. I agree. Uh, so he lives on a small lake. Uh, he says, we've been under a cyanobacteria advisory the past five weeks. Uh, we in the Watershed, Watershed Association suspect the drought conditions are partly responsible. When the water levels come back, hopefully, are there any long-term effects we should worry about? Dissolved oxygen issues, for example? Well, I mean, I could take the easy way out of that and say yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, let's, but let's work at it a little bit. So first of all, Bob, as you know, um, your association should definitely be in contact with New Hampshire lakes, uh, which you probably are very, very familiar with and with the Lakes Management Advisory Commission a Council, uh, which Dave Packard uh, hosts. And these are two organizations designed specifically to give voice to associations like yours, to make sure your concerns uh, are, are uh, identified and addressed uh, statewide. Uh, second, for cyano this year, you know, we did have a slight increase in cyano uh, blooms across the state. We view that not so much as drought impact as temperature impact. Uh, we had warmer, uh, warmer lakes, and um, and uh, the the bacteria tend to enjoy warmer. And uh, we had windier conditions, which causes more turnover, which brings up uh, uh, food, if you will, uh, for the bacteria. So you get a, a couple different dynamics going that we thought were better for cyano uh, this year. We're still analyzing the results for cyano for the total year. We have a couple. Uh, we had a couple new species so show up. One in a spot. Uh, uh, one in a lake where we had a cyano show up that we had not seen before. We're still in the process of identifying exactly what that cyano was and what it means, uh, but we believe it is a, a new appearance for New Hampshire for that particular species. Um, in terms of dissolved oxygen, the thing you have to be concerned about cyano is once you get a cyano bloom in place, uh, the way many of those species work is they'll go encapsulate, uh, you know, or, or they'll go dormant. Uh, after they've uh, bloomed. That means they're still in the water, either in the water column or in the sediments at the bottom. And they, they, they sit and they just wait for optimum conditions to come back again. So yes, uh, the opportunity for the cyano to return is now more likely uh, once you've had a, a serious uh, bloom like it sounds like you had this year. And, and then of course we have a team that works on cyano uh, regularly, and I know you're in contact with them because they probably are the ones who identified your cyano for you and then put in place, helped you put in place uh, the advisory. Um, and so keep working with uh, her team uh, to to talk about cyano and what it means to you and your your lake. Thank you. Another question here, uh, follow up <laughs> on the water quality question: uh, Do low lake and stream levels impact water quality and chemistry, and are those impacts long term? Uh, <laughs> alleviated when water levels rise back up to normal levels? Uh, again, the short answer is yes, but less than you might think. Uh, you know, tannic, tannic acid that makes uh, our, our lakes look uh, brown 
uh, in the uh, in the early spring and, and at other points uh, during the year. Obviously, increase because there's less water, so there's higher concentration in that. But that's not necessarily a long-term uh, concern, nor is it a uh, you know New Hampshire species are evolved to handle that. For us, the bigger concerns are uh, runoff from road surfaces, uh, for example. You know, roads that have been dry for a long period of time build up all the things that automobiles and trucks put down oil, uh, tire, uh, dust, all these other different compounds. Uh, when the storms come, uh, like this one that just came now, all that runs off and it tend to, uh, tends to pulse uh, through the system. Those are the kinds of contaminants that we're concerned about. And then, of course, uh, with water levels low, but people still using a lot of water, we have the salt that comes from uh, water softeners. You know, a lot of people use these water softeners that have a salt recharge system, and all that salt goes into uh, groundwater. And so that contributes to our overall uh, concerns with salt uh, contamination. Uh, and as I mentioned, salt is one of the five uh, top contaminants that I'm worried about, and uh, uh, the drought just exacerbates that to some degree. Thank you. Well, I don't see any other open questions at the moment. We are just about at the end of our time. Uh, I just got a question about, uh, will the recording be available? And the answer is yes. Uh, we will get that up in the next uh, day or so on the on the CARC website. Um, and so folks can feel free to, to check that out, to, uh, to share with anyone they think would be interested. And I encourage people to share. I think this has been really uh, a really interesting conversation, really interesting presentation. Tom, appreciate you uh, spending your time with us this morning to, to talk about water in the state of New Hampshire, uh, you know, about the drought, but really even beyond that, um, and appreciate your your service to the state and the country. And uh, thanks to Sherry for, for coming in and, and pinch hitting a little bit for us. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, is, this has been fabulous. Um, and so just want to say thank you so much and, and thanks to everyone for attending this morning. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks for hosting us and thank you for helping us get our message out on critical aspects about water. We, we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Everybody share the word, conserve water, and hopefully this rain will, uh, will continue and we'll get out of this, this drought. Thanks everybody and have a great day.